Up next, Smiles Lures welcomes you to the Anomaly Archive stream of Thor 2020, Week 2. My bad. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. This is Smiles Lewis, uh, the founder of the 501c3 nonprofit Scientific Anomaly Archives, uh, Anomaly Archives Scientific Anomaly Institute. Sorry, uh, got had my mic muted. Uh, this is the second of our uh, uh, ongoing Saturday Streamathon uh, emergency fundraiser series that we're holding. I was saying how we are trying to raise uh, $20,000, which is our annual budget, uh, three fourths of which is exclusively just our rent so that we can stay at our current locations. Uh, and thank you all for <laughs> alerting me to my mic being muted still. Uh, we uh, this is this is not a professional uh, operation, obviously, uh, but we do our best uh, through the help of our volunteers and uh, so many of which are uh, helping us in in the way of providing the lectures for this uh, streamathon series. And today we've got a great lineup of folks. Um, you can go to our website anomalyarchives.org and see the entire lineup there. Uh, coming up uh, next is going to be uh, Red Pill Junkie Miguel Romero talking about the uh, famous UMO UFO case contactee cult. Uh, what is it exactly? That's what a lot of people need to know. Um, and uh, we're, we're really glad to be doing uh, this, uh, providing this service to you all and hope that you can uh, open your wallets if you're able and, uh, and donate money to our cause. Uh, we are at the $1,300 range. Um, you can see, uh, at our website, we've got our pledge counter there where we are trying to get old Patty Bigfoot there uh, up to the 5,000, 10,000, 15,000, and ultimately into the flying saucer above her to the $20,000 mark. And we currently do have a matching grant, a challenge grant of $5,000. So if we can reach $5,000, we'll have $10,000. And uh, we really uh, hope that you can help us with that. So uh, coming up in just a moment is going to be, uh, uh, as I mentioned, Red Pill Junkie uh, talking about uh, the UMO case. And we uh, have also coming up Brent Rains 
and uh, let's see who else. Uh, I'm drawing a blank. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, coming up after after Miguel is uh, Professor Wham, who will be uh, leading an interesting discussion, talking about race in the paranormal and UFO fields, as well as then Brent Rains talking about UFOs, uh, the myths, and the Matrix. And uh, then we've got uh, some other surprises up today, and then uh, Chris Rukowski, and then at the end of the day, we'll have um, uh, a showing of Craig Baldwin's amazing collage movie mock-up on Moo. So stay with us. We'll be right back and uh, stay tuned. May I please have your attention? I would like for you to see the Anomaly Archives poster. It features many creatures and artifacts from the stranger reaches of the globe and beyond. First you will find a cryptid named Patty, an elusive creature rarely caught on film but here immortalized borrowing books from the archives. An MIB is seen in the background doing what we can only believe is deep research into our files. A ghostly apparition has appeared and is seen reading a book about a very scary subject. At regular intervals about the archives, the poster also features forgotten treasures and mystical symbols. The longer you stare at the poster, the more fantastic things you will find. To view it long after the video has ended, visit the archive shop where you can find it emblazoned on t-shirts, posters, and other household objects. Thank you for your attention. Up next, Miguel Romero, also known as Red Pill Junkie, presenting smoke, mirrors, and plexiglass windows. The nested deceptions of Planet Moon. Okay, folks, welcome back. This is uh, Smiles Lewis again for the second Anomaly Archives Streamathon. Uh, this uh, being Saturday, November 28th, 2020, and oh, what a year it has been. Uh, that is because of the uh, trials and tribulations of this amazingly strange, uh, surreal year that we are uh, forced to uh, take these emergency fundraising actions. But uh, you know what, at least it's brought us all together and it's, it's bringing uh, so many wonderful people to, to, to the fore who I think uh, deserve your attention. And our next uh, presenter is uh, Miguel Romero who is described himself as an agnostic gnostic walking conundrum and metaphysical oxymoron. The mysterious RPJ leaves, leads a double life. By day, he serves as Grand Master of the International Sacred Order of Lucha Libre, but at night he pursues his lifelong study of everything considered mysterious and or paranormal, a term he personally detests. When he's not exploring the web looking for his daily fix of Fortiana, he can be found blogging, doodling, fooling around, and offering his services as news administrator and writer at the Daily Grail. He also regularly participates in other websites and podcasts like Radio Misterioso and Where Did the Road Go? He impatiently awaits the return of the mothership in Mexico City. And without further ado, I let me bring on Miguel. Miguel, hold on. There we go. Hey, Miguel. Hola, hola. Buenas tardes. 
Thank you so much for joining us. I'm really looking forward to your lecture. I uh, got a sampling of it before at another great conference, the Strange Realities uh, Conference, the second one, the, the first being physical in uh, Nashville, I believe. And uh, mm -hmm. wish I wish I'd gotten to go to that one, but at least I was able to attend the virtual one where you premiered uh, uh, this lecture. And also, this that was your first lecture of that sort ever, right? Yeah, indeed. This is like. Uh... They were my guinea pigs. <laughs> well, you did a great job, and I'm so excited to uh, work with you on this and and to see the the uh, even fuller version of the presentation. Um, so, without further ado, let me go ahead and get myself out of here. But uh, I will add, yes, that little ad that we had there before uh, uh, is, is, of course, a, a wonderful representation of uh, Miguel's work. Uh, he is a joy to work with. He is a very talented artist, and um, I, I guess some some might describe the style as caricature, but you actually do a, a wide variety of styles and have done some amazing book covers from some of my favorite books. And uh, I know we're going to continue to see more of you, hear more of you, and read more of you, and I'm very glad to, for that. So uh, here we go, Miguel. I'm going to get out of here and let you take it away. I'm going to... Perfect. Thank you. All right. As, um, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Well, afternoon here in, in Mexico City. Uh, as for who am I, uh, people often, often ask me that. Uh, my name is Miguel Romero. I'm a, I'm a Mexican citizen. I live in Mexico City, although uh, most people know me by the nickname that I chose, uh, you know, back in, I guess, since before 2007, Red Peel Junkie. And um, uh, it's funny how people, uh, some people say, uh, say that everybody that is involved in, in ufology is a journalist. And everybody that is involved in cryptozoology is a biologist, and everybody that is involved in, in ghost hunting is a scientist. You know, I'm I'm a blogger and I draw stuff. That's it. You know, that uh, I started becoming involved in the so-called paranormal scene uh, by becoming a, a, a news uh, aggregator on the Daily Grail. You know, that's the, that's the the their banner at the top. And from then, uh, you know, I guess I started to become more and more involved in it and started to write things. Uh, I've never written a book, but uh, I have uh, written uh, things that are uh, uh, an essay that appeared in this wonderful anthology that you can see on, on the right side of your screen, UFOs Reframing the Debate, that was edited by my friend in the UK, Robbie Graham, and that featured uh, many of my best friends in, in this uh, crazy world of the paranormal. And some of them, you know, obviously uh, uh, will be also speaking here in the Streamathon 2020, including, you know, our, our very own Smiles Lewis. I guess you can see them. He's just, just above me <laughs> on, on, the, on the lower uh, um, hand that is reframing the, the UFO. And on the left side, you can see the icon of my, my own uh, webpage, Absorbed by Design. I guess it's kind of like a company or a thing that I'm trying to do in order to, to, to create artwork and uh, create uh, the, uh, uh, book designs like the cover of, of UFOs Reframing the Debate that you can see there. Okay, but enough, enough about me, um, because we're here to talk about UFOs. And especially we're going to talk about a story which has fascinated me ever since I was a kid, the so-called UMO affair. It's a very complex, very murky part of UFO history spanning many decades with many protagonists in different countries. And it's the kind of story that tends to polarize opinions. You know, for many, many years, many bright minds believed, believed in it and considered it to be the best evidence of extraterrestrial visitation. Others thought that it was just a total hoax, an example of the U UFO mystery being manipulated for obscure purposes, you know. But as for me, I consider myself to be a member of what is called the excluded middle, uh, excluded middle school of thought. And I think of it as an example of fraud and high strangeness mixed together by the self-negating nature of the UFO phenomenon. So if an hour from now on, I leave you even more confused about UMO than you were in the beginning, that means that I did my job well, okay? So let's get down to it. But uh, before we start, I should forewarn you that during this presentation, 
we're going to discuss a few touchy subjects. We're going to talk about sex. We're going to touch upon several types of uh, sexual abuse. And we're going to pepper things up with some scatology uh, while discussing eschatology and even some s and just for, you know, good measure. So uh, you can say you're not getting enough uh, bang for your buck here. Okay, yes? All right. So a little bit of um, historical context before we enter proper into the story. You know, this, this story uh, started in 1966, not even 30 years since the Civil War ended. Uh, Spain, Spain was an impoverished country and under Franco's uh, fascist dictatorship. It's funny how, you know, if you, you ask an American, hey, you know, what was the purpose of World War II? They will say, where? Well, we went to Europe to fight fascism. And maybe a Spanish citizen will say, uh, you missed the spot, senor? Uh, hello? Because Franco stayed in power until the end of his, his death in 1975. And it was a very, very oppressive regime. And maybe that's the reason why uh, the UFO phenomenon attracted so many enthusiasts in Spain from the beginning, very beginning of the flying saucer era. I mean, if your surroundings are horrible, maybe you, this, to, you try to look up to the sky, you know, in, in search of hope, search of, of answers. And one of those who looked up was this gentleman here with a, with a funny beard. This guy was uh, Fernando Cessna. And he's, uh, he, he's mentioned as a post office and telegraph employee in, in biographies, although other references mention him as a telephone company employee. Well, in other words, he was just a, a small, small uh, bureaucrat, right? So he, he becomes interested in UFOs in the 1950s and begins to write articles in small newspapers. And in 1954, he founds the Society of Friends of Space Visitors, or Buru. He claims to have watched his first flying saucer in July of 1961. And he wrote several books, you know, like, you know, like, like American contactees. Flying saucers come from other worlds. I, confident of the spaceman, I mean, he's not just a friend of the spaceman, he is a, a confident. And Umo, another inhabited world, which is uh, the, the, he, it's the most famous one and the one that we're going to discuss here in this in presentation. And it's funny because when I uh, found uh, the book, um, I, Confident of the Spaceman, I thought it was about Umo, but later, later I learned that it was from with um, this guy, Sesma, uh, talking about his alleged encounters with beings from planet Auko, which supposedly was in Alpha Centauri. And began those, the, that encounter began in, in October of 1962. And here's a curious trivia for you guys. In the book, he describes the Aukians as having long hair that cover all of their bodies. So hooray for space Bigfoots. And maybe, you know, maybe perhaps the book made him something of a target because by early 1966, in January to be exact, he receives a telephone call from someone claiming to be named Day 98, a man from another world. You know, he and the and voice was kind of weird. He has he, he was it was kind of nasal and like like the person was suffering from asthma, and he was also kind of like dis, distorted electronically. And, and this caller promised that in the coming months, Sesma will receive items of an extraterrestrial order. Okay, so uh, sure enough, a man later came to visit Sesma and presented himself as an emissary from the men of outer space and gave Sesma some three-dimensional photographs which showed enhanced biological cross-sections. And Sesma was, you know, totally amazed about this, as you could imagine. Like, oh my God, I'm holding in my hands an actual extraterrestrial device. Uh, the image in your left is the cover from his uh, book about Umo. And by the way, that uh, little, you know, uh, kind of like monster thing has absolutely nothing to do with, with the story. But I guess he found some uh, curious thing, like look at it like an alien, like an alien and say, well, let's put that there. And the other two images are from a Mexican, like comics-like magazine called uh, Revista Duda, 
which published in the 1970s a very comprehensive uh, story or rendition of uh, uh, Sesma's claims. In the right image, we can see how this device, this uh, alleged uh, object uh, that uh, had uh, biological cross sections, uh, was supposedly analyzed, according to Sesma, by a member of the Faculty of Medicine in the University of Madrid. The name of this professor was obviously never given. And this emissary, the guy who came up with, with these uh, photos, also delivered a thick dossier with me, many typewritten pages with ample information about these visitors who claim to have come from a planet called Umo. The man said to be a professional typist and that one day two men who looked Scandinavian to him came to his office. And these men said they were Danish doctors and wanted him to work for them on some reports of a scientific nature. And gradually they revealed their true extraterrestrial origin. And by the way, the reason why they couldn't type the pages themselves is because uh, of, of an apparent hypersensibility that they suffer in their fingertips. So, you know, going to, uh, using a typewriter will be like, oh, ah, ah, ah. And yes, in case you were wondering, using also an elevator and try push a button was a total bitch for these people. And the three-dimensional device was retrieved later by the type, typist, you know, just a few days later. Very convenient, right? All right, who does he remind you of? This is a little game that we're going to be playing during this presentation. And, and the man in the, the right screen, in the right side of the screen, needs no introduction. If you're, if you're a seasoned UFO fan, it's Mr. George Adamski, or Adamski, I guess some people call him that, is the most famous of the uh, contactees in the 1950s. And the reason why I compare these two individuals is um, several. There are several reasons. One is their grandiloquent claims. Um, the other one is their inflated credentials. They, these guys love to brag about themselves. Uh, with the, in the case of Sesma, he claimed to be a state functionary who successfully premiered in Madrid the stage play, a stage play The Secret of Lady Margarita. This was in, in, in the back of one of his books, so he wrote this himself. He also claimed to be a collaborator in many magazines and author of books like The Psychic Compass, Detective-like and Logic Problems, I, Confident of the Spaceman, The Rock of Wisdom, etc., etc. And with Adamski, we know that uh, he loved to call himself a professor of, 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 of philosophy, even though that he didn't hold any, any degrees in that regard. Other things in common with these two men, unprovable claims, of course, uh, a desire to become a figurehead. You know, Adamski became the, the most famous contactee for a reason. Claims of interaction with different types of spacemen. You know, in, in the case of Adamski, uh, you know, that Orthon, the Venusian battle with, with which he started his, his career as a contactee, was not the only uh, space brother he met. He also claimed to have met uh, men from Saturn and Mars or whatever. But more importantly than that, the reason these two men are so alike is because it, they are an example of when somebody else cons the con man. With Adamski, there's a very famous story of how James Mosley, Mosley and Gray Barker um, uh, sent him a hoax letter in, in FBI stationery, I think, uh, the straight hoax letter is, is known. And if you want to know more about that, I suggest you give a listen to uh, The Saucer Life, a wonderful podcast that is run by Aaron Gullias, who's also going to uh, appear here in the, at the Streamathon. Or you might pick a copy of A's for Adamski that wa wa was written by my two friends, Adam Gorightly and Greg Bishop. Okay. The Happy Whale. The Café Lyon was for a time a very popular place among the intellectual elite of Spain, Spain's capital uh, in the years of the Second Republic. This means from 1931 to uh, uh, 1939, I think. Sesma and his friends of space visitors, his group, chose this place to celebrate their weekly salons, which used to gather a lot of attendance. You know, there was a lot of interest, like I said, and that's probably the reason why, why they were also closely monitored by Franco's secret police. 
It was in these salons that Cessna kept his followers informed about the dossier and letters he was receiving. And here is where they also discuss the news of an alleged landing of a flying saucer in a place called Aluche. It's a barrio uh, close to Madrid on February 16th, 1966, which they thought confirmed the UMO contact because the object described by the witnesses had in its belly the same symbol that appeared stamped in the dossier received by Cessna. It was also in the Happy Whale Salons that on May 30th, 1967, at approximately 10 p.m., that a letter received by Cessna that very morning was read. This new letter announced the future arrival of Umite spaceships within the next three days, you know, from May 30th and June 3rd, on three given sites, Bolivia, Spain, and Brazil. And curiously enough, only in, on the Spanish uh, site were given semi-specific coordinates. The landing site was not too far from Madrid. And the Umites explained this vagueness like they couldn't be more precise by saying that the isodynamic properties of the of space time prevented them from, from knowing the exact date and location of the arrival of their spaceships. The letter stipulated that this information was not to be shared with any government institution nor with the press. So that left Sesma and his group in a pickle, you know, because not alerting the press, then how do you validate the authenticity of the letter if the landing happened? So they decided because it was so late and they couldn't find a public notary that the letter was to be signed by 30 witnesses. And, and there, there's a, uh, the letter has been uh, preserved by, 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 by someone, and you can see um, you know, all the uh, uh, signatures stamped on top of it, including the signature of a man identifying himself as Jose Luis Peña. Okay, so the Aluche landing was claimed to have taken place at around 8 p.m. on a Sunday near a farm or a ranch called El Relajal. And the main witnesses was a man called Jose Luis Jordan Peña. And the name's kind of familiar, right? Rings a bell. And Vicente Ortuño. And these guys claim not to know each other. Peña sent a letter to the press claiming at the time he was driving home. And at first he thought the object was a helicopter. He tried to make the owners of the farm to come out and look of the, at the UFO, but they didn't listen to him. He then went to a nearby bar called Palencia to announce, announce his sighting. Later, as if to confirm his claims, a group of military recruits came into the bar saying they too had seen the UFO landing. Ortuño claimed he saw the flying saucer from a window at his sixth floor apartment. Uh, you can see at the center of the, of, of the screen, is the, one of the strange rectangular depressions that were forming some, a sort of triangular pattern that were found later. And the, and the drawing at the left was made by Peña. And you can see that you can already see some kind of like a weird symbol that kind of looks like the, the Umo symbol, but it's not exactly. And, and the, on the right is uh, well, one of the articles in, that appear in the newspaper of the time. All right. So a little recap here. So Cessna's group of friends of outer space had read the, the latest letter from UMO on May the 30th, late at night, announcing the imminent arrival of the UMO spaceships. They couldn't alert anyone, nor the press or the police. And by then, they had discovered that the Jose Luis Peña that was part of their salons was the same Jose Luis Jordan Peña that had been witness to the Aluche landing of 1966. Ortuño, the other main witness uh, of the Aluche uh, landing, was also an attendant. And remember how they claimed they didn't know each other initially? Well, turns out they now seem to be good friends, but somehow nobody thought that was weird. And Peña had become like the leader of the skeptics in Sesma's little group. He said, for example, he believed the object he saw in Aluche was an American secret project and not uh, an extraterrestrial craft. Sesma and his followers figured out the landing coordinates, which was around a municipality close to Madrid called Alarcón, where there are a couple of uh, palatial, 
palatial residences built in 1917 called the Castles of Los Marqueses de San Jose de Valderas. So they decided to patrol the periphery of Madrid in a caravan of vehicles and be on the lookout. But eventually they got tired and gave up. Remember, the date and location was a little vague, so they really couldn't know when the, the, the UFOs will, will appear. So the photos of the saucer, which you can see there, appeared on the newspaper Informaciones two days later, on June the 2nd, on the front page. Journalist Antonio San Antonio received the photographs in a letter sent by a man identifying himself as Antonio Pardo, saying the photos had been taken by him and another photographer who chose to remain anonymous at around 8 p.m. Pardo said the object was approximately 12 meters in diameter and hovered near the place for approximately 10 minutes. It was said to glow faintly. San Antonio ran the story without conducting any investigation himself, and the newspaper stated there were several witnesses who, who claimed to have seen the object. We will return to this later. Okay, so Sesma's group read the newspaper article and, uh, and saw the photos and were like, oh man, we missed it. We, we need to send someone there to, to investigate. And they were like, hey, let's send the, the skeptic guy. You know, let's send the skeptic, the skeptic guy so he can finally realize this is real and we are in contact with extraterrestrials. And who is the skeptic guy? Is no other, none other than Jose Luis Jordan Peña. And Peña goes like, yeah, I'll go. In fact, why don't I go with my new best friend, Vicente Ortuño, and we're going to go there and we're going to check the things out and investigate and we'll get back to you guys. All right. So Peña comes back from his investigation and tells, you know, Sesma and the group, hey, guys, guess what? We went to the neighborhood to interview witnesses and found that someone has been putting some ads on walls and telephone poles showing photos of a strange metallic cylinder. The ad said the cylinder had been found near where the flying saucer showed up and that if anyone found more, there was a substantial reward. And, that, and everybody was like, what? What's, what's all this? Okay, let's leave Sesma and his little group for a minute. And meanwhile, uh, Catalan researcher Marius Leguet received an unsolicited letter sent by the same Antonio Pardo, who was one of the San Jose de Valderas photographers. Pardo claimed to have also found another of these strange alien cylinders. He forced open it, and inside the cylinder, there was purportedly a strange foamy liquid that came out, and also a thin piece of apple green plastic. Uh, which had the UMO symbol, symbol engraved in it. I don't know if you can check the, the, the photos. There are of a very poor quality, but uh, there is kind of like an embossed in the thin plastic, uh, the, the famous UMO symbol. And this guy Pardo enclosed in the letter he sent to Leguet the plastic film with also a small sample of the metal, metal container. And Leguet receives this and is all like, uh, what the hell is this? You know, he probably realized there was something fishy going on. So he decided to get real, get rid of these materials and send, send them instead to two of his colleagues, Antonio Rivera and Rafael Farrios. Okay, Antonio Rivera, who is the man in the center, he was a true Renaissance man. He was quite probably the most important ufologist in Spain, and certainly the most famous one among the English-speaking English members of the UFO field. He wrote dozens of books, not just about UFOs, but also about submarine exploration and science fiction novels, including at least four books devoted entirely to the UMO affair. The first one being uh, the one shown uh, to the left of your screen, a Perfect Case, or Un Caso Perfecto, first published in 1969. He, th this man spoke and wrote in six languages. He was very smart. But uh, as my friend Michael M. Hughes, who is, among other things, uh, he's a professional magician, he once told me that uh, the problem is that the smarter the man, 
the easier he is to fool. This is something that uh, magicians use to their advantage. Okay, the man to the right, Rafael Farriols, was a respected, bright, and wealthy industrialist from Barcelona who had successfully applied his studies in chemistry in order to make his company one of the biggest exporters of acrylic plastic in all of Europe. He was interested in things like horse breeding, philosophy, photography, but the reason why we are remembering him today is because of his active interest in UFOs. So Rivera and Farriols started to investigate the story and wrote about it, judging it a perfect case. Well, hence the title of their book. Uh, and this was actually a reference to J. Allen Hynek, the, the uh, Close Encounters man, who had always hoped for a perfect case to finally arrive to meet the harsh standards of the skeptic community. And, and uh, if you ask me, it's kind of like a tall order saying, this, this is the one, this is the silver bullet we were hoping for, but you know, that's what uh, River and Farrell did. And interestingly enough, in the book, Rivera and Farrells omitted any reference to the letters received by Sesma and his Madrid group. They just focused instead on the Alucha landing and the San Jose de Valderas photos and concluded it was probably the same object. As years went by, Rivera devoted a lot of his career and reputation in proving that a group of extraterrestrials had infiltrated our society and was providing evidence of their existence. Another interesting tidbit, the Spanish Air Force never investigated these alleged landings, at least officially, and we will get back to this later. And the justification they gave Rivera is that what happens on the ground is none of, their, none of our concern. It's like, okay, that's what they said to him. Who knows? All right. Who do they remind you of? Uh, to me, the comparison between uh, Rivera and, and the late Stanton Friedman is pretty obvious, you know. They were both ufologists who remained well respected by most of their peers, but their critics attacked them for being too invested in a story that is not as rock solid as they initially thought. You know, in the case of Friedman, we're of course talking about Roswell and the uh, controversial MJ-12 papers. In the case with uh, Farrios, the man uh, to the right, close to him, is uh, Paul Benowitz, who is not uh, that well known. Is something that is someone that is very interesting because both of them had scientific knowledge. In the case of uh, Farrios, he was a chemist. In the case of Benowitz, he was an electrical engineer. Both used their uh, scientific knowledge to become independently wealthy, and they both used their wealth to finance their interest or obsession in UFOs. And both, I think, are examples of people who were targeted by feeding them this information. You know, in the case of Farriols, he became one of the recipients of the UMO letters that we're going to discuss, or we've been discussing. And in the case of uh, Benewitz, um, the, the, I suggest people to go and, and read uh, Project Beta by my friend Greg Bishop, or that you uh, watch the documentary Mirage Man. But uh, uh, Benewitz is at the center of, of the famous um, Dulce alien underground base and all that mythology that erupted in the, in the early 1980s. Okay, the veneer of plausibility. Why do some UFO myths last longer than others? To me, the answer lies in what I choose to call the veneer of plausibility. You see, the UMO letters were not just sent to recipients in Madrid and Barcelona. There were hundreds, if not thousands of pages, which were apparently sent to people in Europe and Latin America. France, Italy, Germany, Argentina, Mexico, etc. The letters carried international postage stamps, meaning they had been mailed in other countries. For example, if you receive your, uh, an UMO letter and you are in Madrid, maybe you will see that the letter was sent uh, in Australia, which meant, you know, uh, that there was kind of like a, an international effort to be sending these letters. And 
Another thing, these are not the new agey platitudes and moral admonitions received by American contactees in the 50s and 60s. These pages contain detailed information on all sorts of topics, physics, mathematics, chemistry, biology, and cybernetics, to name just a few. Unlike the American contactees, contactees who use vague terms like magnetic energy or vibrations, to explain how flying saucers worked, the Umites, on the other hand, were not shy of getting into the nitty gritty of their science and technology. The stylistic level of the language used in the letters, which was extremely dry and highfalutin, gave the impression of a very analytical mind. And the tidbits of Umite language peppered in the letters, for example, their spaceships were called Wawolea or Wewa, and God was called Woa, and man was called Ueni. So that this language was also investigated by linguists who never did reach a definite conclusion. I mean, they were never discredited as a pure gibberish either. So it's kind of like uh, Lord of the Rings or how Tolkien invented whole languages, you know, the Elvish and and and. and the anguish of the, of the dwarves, something like that. And also there were scientists and engineers like Jean-Pierre Petit and Claude Poer, uh, French uh, scientists and uh, French uh, engineers, who became very interested in the UMO material. Petit, for example, even went so far as claiming that many of his aerospace ideas were inspired by these letters. So the consensus among the people who believed in this material was, if this is a hoax, it was either created by a genius or a, a large group of specialists. Okay, so ultimately the UMO affair is, uh, just like the Bob Lazar affair, what you will expect from a simple, almost comforting ETH, purely materialist explanation of the UFO phenomenon, although with some small caveats. So there's no high strangeness whatsoever in this. No ancient astronauts controversy too. Uh, no galactic federation either. You know, when, when the Umites, for example, were asked, uh, what about uh, other UFOs? Are you responsible for that? They will answer, uh, no, we, we, we don't know anything about those. You know, I mean, we also, we also get uh, our visitors, you know, from time to time in our planet. And about their planet, Umo, was a planet or a cold star, they call it, orbiting the Wolf 424 star system, which is approximately 14.6 light years away from our planet. So these are not beings from another galaxy. If you're a UFO buff and you read 14.6, you say, eh, I mean, these guys are practically our neighbors, you know, they're just around the corner. I mean, uh, think about Stanton Friedman, who was always saying, uh, very interested about the Zeta Reticuli uh, position that was found in the famous uh, Mercury Fish star map, saying, hey, Zeta Reticulis is uh, rather close, you know, in, in light years, like I think it's 30 something light years. And if you are go going at, the, at uh, almost the speed of light, you reach here in like six months. Uh, okay. The image in your screen is an artist rep artist representation of what is known as the Kardashev scale, a system proposed by Soviet astrophysicist Nikolai Kardashev. This, the, the Kardashev scale is meant to, to try to rank uh, the level of adv advancements of alien civilizations. And in the Kardashev scale, UMO will be a true type one civilization or between type one and type two. It uh, means that, that they have managed to, to Harner, uh, uh, harness the energy of their whole planet and are in the process of harnessing the energy of the whole of the whole their whole solar system. In that scale, us on planet Earth are not even 0.7, you know, just to give you a, a, a sense of, of, of proportion. And for example, what they call is that they obtain their energy from the volcanic activity on their planet and from large arrays of mirrors that collected the light from their sun. So no zero point energy from these guys. Sorry, Dr. Greer. How did they find us? 
completely by accident. In what to us will be the year 1948, their sensors detected a signal they couldn't decipher coming from our star system. Later, it was determined by their scientists that this transmission had been generated by a Norwegian ship, which in February of 1934 conducted a series of high free, high fry, oh, sorry, a series of high frequency communications tests using the ionosphere to bounce the signal. And one of those signals was powerful enough to escape the atmosphere and travel for 14 years until it reached UMO. On March 28, 1950, their first scouting ship took ground in the French Alps, eight kilometers away from the village of La Javie. They couldn't travel anywhere they wanted, these guys, whenever they wanted. The isodynamic conditions of space had to be just right before they could attempt a journey to another star system. So in other words, these guys were not all powerful alien overlords, which helped to justify their reluctance to show themselves openly to, to uh, our civilization. The cherry on top of the message, the Umites themselves encouraged skepticism and kept advising their correspondents to distrust the information provided in their letters. The self-negation was part of their plan not to influence human civilization too much. You know, like Star Trek, they govern themselves by a prime directive. In fact, their account about their first days on Earth sounds just exactly like a Star Trek episode. If Gene Roddenberry hadn't worried about censorship, for example, they talk about how their scouts leave the craft and they start searching the grounds and they find a strange material, a strange like wrinkled paper-like uh, object covered in a brown substance that they later determined that it was a newspaper covered in, in, in human feces. <laughs> and, and at first they considered it to be, maybe this is a human ritual, you know, maybe this is the way that humans criticize something that an article they're writing and they, you know, they, they, they show their contempt uh, by smothering with, the, with their excrement. And, and by the way, uh, that news, this newspaper was, according to the letters, carefully preserved and today is proudly displayed in a museum on their planet. Probably uh, uh, something of great fascination because here's another thing of shows that how advanced they were. The Umites didn't poop. That's right. You know, these were a civilization advanced enough that they had managed to find a way how to, their bodies would not uh, need to excrete uh, uh, feces. And this is interesting, you know, because even in Star Trek, you know there is a, a, a part of the USS Enterprise where number one is doing number two. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, getting back to their, their, their first uh, days on planet Earth, their first communication with a young shepherd boy uh, was conducted with just mimicry, you know, trying to learn uh, uh, basic the basic of uh, human language, in this case, French. And they also claim how they entered the house, conducted medical examinations from the people inside, stole a few items for analysis, although they say that they later compensated uh, uh, those people for their intrusions. In other words, these guys were explorers. These are not space brothers. They didn't come here to promote universal peace and sing Kumbaya with us and to make us give up our nuclear arsenal. If World War III had suddenly erupted, the Umites wouldn't have lifted a single finger to save us. Maybe with one exception, which happened during the 1973 Yom Kippur War, which I mentioned in an article I wrote for Mysterious Universe. Um, you should probably check it out. I think it was written in 19 in 2019, 2018. Okay. So in case it wasn't clear by now, the men and women from UMO were exactly like us. And by that, I mean, they were your typical Nordic, you know, blonde alien. No racial diversity whatsoever on their planet because supposedly in UMO, there was only one continent. The main difference is that when they reach adult age, their vocal cords became atrophied and could only communicate through telepathy, which few exceptions, and those, the people who managed to keep their, their vocal cords intact were the ones that were commissioned to be scouts here on planet Earth. And 
A lot of the letters dealt with describing what life was like on planet Umo. And you uh, go through this material, which is uh, actually, actually widely available on, on, on the internet, and you see a lot of weird contrasts here. For example, they claim to be nature lovers, and they will spend many days outside, you know, surrounded by, by, by nature. But their dwellings were full of high technology. Their clothes, for example, didn't need to be washed. They could be created the instant they needed it and destroyed once they discarded them, you know, very convenient. They were also not complete vegetarian hippies, these guys. They enjoyed, for example, eating the meat of a flying animal resembling a bat. They claimed to enjoy complete freedom, but all the facets of their lives were arbitrated by a group of supercomputers from their economy to their marriages. And the, their society was based on nuclear families, yet every children around the age of 13 had to leave their homes and enter into a very strict form of a Spartan-like form of university. Uh, the kids were not allowed to communicate with the parents until they graduated. But parents could monitor their kids, unbeknownst to the kids, anytime they wanted. So yeah, spying on your kids because that's not freaky at all. They said they had eliminated the want for material things, but unlike the Space Brothers of American contactees, these guys were not complete socialists or communists. They didn't use currency, but instead a type of what we now would call a computer blockchain that tallied their wealth based on their labor performance divided by their intellectual potential. So kind of like a you know, capi computerized capitalist meritocracy. Men and women had equal rights, but in the marriage, the wife had to be completely subservient to the husband. I mean, it says something about Spanish society in the 1960s and 70s when no one found that to be weird or controversial, you know? They did have crime in, in Umo occasionally, but if the crime was too great, instead of enforcing the death penalty, the convict became a sort of slave to society and could be borrowed as a guinea pig in, a, in scientific experiments. I mean, that's more humane, right? There was no war in Umo anymore, obviously. But in their past, they did suffer dark periods of deep social tensions and strife, a lot of which had been provoked provoked by the ranged individual suffering from a, from a sort of ma madness that caused them to send telepathic screams that will upset all of society. So their solution, <clears throat> kill these poor bastards because their illness, you know, their illness was untreatable. I mean, it's harsh, but can you imagine living in a world in which you will be constantly bombarded by, by the deranged thoughts of, of, of madmen uh, Oh, wait, I just got a tweet. Huh. Wow. Yeah, not retweeting that. Okay. Some people never call the society, some people have this call the society described by the Umo letters as pseudo fascist. And to be fair, the Umites never suggested to their correspondents that earthlings should emulate them. But it's true, but that many of their elements in their society were kind of disturbing. Okay, how disturbing? Well, to answer that, let us now take a look into the sexual habits of the Umites. Yeah, time to get kinky, baby. Mm -hmm. Well, although not too kinky, you see, because for starters, nudity was something of a big taboo in Umo society. Children were not allowed to see their parents naked. Well, okay. And wives could only see, be seen naked by their husbands and vice versa. Well, okay. But spouses, when they wish to have sex, would always undress with the lights out because the sight alone of seeing their partners take their clothes off was so arousing they could easily reach orgasm. Oh, and remember the slaves to society we, we mentioned earlier? 
they were forced to be naked as a mark of shame. Um, what about homosexuals? Well, of course, that was a disease. They didn't suffer any longer because they had conveniently eradicated it. Hmm. Masturbation was prevented by different techniques because their goal was that no citizen of UMO would experience an orgasm before marriage. WTF! Okay, to compensate for this, they would encourage their citizens to get married as quickly as possible. Uh, thank God, I mean, thank war. Uh, the lips were not among their erogenous zones, so no kissing in planet Umo, and no Kama Sutra either, thank you. They, they had said they had check, uh, checked uh, Eastern sexual practices, and they didn't find any use for that. And obviously no porn in Umo either, but they would make audio, audio recordings when they were having sexual intercourse, but not for erotic purposes, mind you, but because you see, it was their tradition among them to cherish the memory of your dearly depart departed parents by listening to the sounds they recorded while they were conceiving you. So if you're cringing right now, that's because you are not advanced enough to understand the Uma way of life, man. Okay, so maybe we're now we're finally getting a sense of why their language was so many, have so many O's and O's. I mean, these are the Mormons of the universe. Although in retrospect, it's kind of nice and comforting to think that there's a whole planet of people that are more uh, sexually repressed than I am. <clears throat> Moving on. Okay. But perhaps there was a reason why the poor Umites were so messed up. You know, in some of the letters, they go into their ancient history. And where one particularly disturbing chapter, it was the tyranny of Ea 456. In Ea 456 was a child prodigy who became the supreme ruler of Umo at just 14 eight years of age. And when she was 16, she declared herself, herself to be the owner of all the beings of Umo, and the main goal of society will be scientific advancement. So all the citizens who were deemed to have a low IQ were sentenced to be killed by vivisection for experimentation. EF456 used to have audiences with all the great scientists of UMO, so she could test them. They had to appear before her naked, remember, naked, nakedness being a big no-no, and if they passed the test, she would reward them by forcing them to eat her excrement and drink her urine. Oh, and she was an infomaniac too. So you might be thinking, what the hell, RPG? What's, where are you going with, with all of this? Well, well, first because it's kind of funny, and also because I feel that by examining the most peculiar aspects of the letter, we might get a sense of the mentality of the person or persons who wrote them. You know, I'm not a scientist. I can't judge the content of the letters by their scientific merit. Although I'm aware that several scientists found the human content to be intriguing. But what I can do is to look into the letters that delve into the UMO society and get a sense of the values and psychology of the author. You know, the same way that you go into the Old Testament and you realize, yeah, these guys were kind of like uh, misogynistic uh, douchebags. Okay. We have stated that one of the reasons behind the UMO affairs longevity is its veneer of plausibility. But what happens if you start to scratch the surface? Oscar Ray Brea, the man on the left, was a tele telecommunications engineer, and he's, he is considered to be the pioneer of Spanish ufology. So in the 1960s, Ray Brea analyzed the San Jose de Valderas photographs and concluded, surprise, surprise, they were fake. The photos were clearly taken by a single photographer instead of two. Not only that, but the object is closer to the camera than what was claimed. Thus, we're talking about a small model and not a disc of 12 meters in diameter. And subsequent analysis found what looks to be a thin string supporting the model. Although some investigators like Juan Jose Benitez, which, who we'll be discussing later, still argue that the analysis was made with a second generation copy of the negative and the line is just a scratch. For the record, 
I'm perfectly comfortable with uh, deeming the photographs to be fakes, to be their clear, uh, uh, the saucer is a clear uh, model made with uh, plastic plates, styrofoam plates, that hence the apparent kind of like translucent quality of the object. Other critics also claim that the advanced scientific notions containing the letters were taken from contemporary scientific articles, just like Bob Lazar, and also from science fiction novels. Jacques Vallée, the man on the, on, the, on the right, was always skeptic of the Umu affair from the start. In his book, The Invisible College, Vallée devotes the entire fourth chapter to Umu, where he speculates whether it could have been some sort of experiment in socio-psychological manipulation, perpetrated perhaps by a military intelligence group. His reasoning for this was backed by the analysis of the metal and plastic samples received by Rivera and Farrell. Remember that? The materials were analyzed by the Spanish National Institute for Space Research. The analysis concluded the metal was a very pure alloy of nickel, and the plastic film was polyvinyl fluoride which at the time was only manufactured by the DuPont company and was used by NASA and also the military for uh, special uh, purposes. So even though the material was not found to be uh, of otherworldly origin, neither was something you could purchase in any hardware store in Madrid. Uh, here's a curious trivia. In one of his published journals, Forbidden Science, Volume 2, Ballet tells how in July of 1974, he took a trip to the French Alps to look for the UMO base using the coordinates given to him by Pat Price, the SRI remote viewer. Needless to say, he couldn't find it. Okay, the years passed, the supply of new UMO letters ebbed and flow, the majority of the field forgot about them and moved on, and in the meantime, younger investigators in Spain were trying to join the pieces of the puzzle and a lot, of their, a lot of their evidence pointed to a figure who had been involved in the UMU affair from the very beginning, a figure by the name of José Luis Jordán Peña. Peña was a very complex and troubled man, which shouldn't surprise us too much now that we uh, explore some of the most uh, disturbing content in the UMU letters. He worked for many years as an industrial psychologist, though he didn't hold any degrees, he was an informant for the Catholic Church after the Civil War. By 1974, he had a police record and was charged for threatening someone. He was a vice president of the Spanish Society of Parapsychology, so not a complete skeptic. On April, April of 1993, he sends a confession letter to Rafael Farreos, the co-writer of A Perfect Case, saying, yeah, I faked the whole thing. The phone calls, the letters, the Aluche landing, the San Jose de Valera's photos, the tube and the plastic strip, even the symbol himself was his creation, according to Peña. And if you notice in, Peña, in Peña's photos that I chose there, that, ha that have his face, Steve, that's because in 1988, he suffered a stroke which paralyzed half of his body pre and prevented him from continuing to write the letters and maintaining the hoax. Uh, whether he got what he deserved or not, I'll leave it to you. But wait a minute. The recruits and other witnesses of the Alucha landing, what about those guys? Well, Peña said that he either paid them or were lying. And Dito with the other San Jose de Valderas witnesses. Vicente Ortuño, for example, the other main witness of Aluche, had been his collaborator all along. He, by the way, had been the emissary that had given Fernando Sesma those weird three-dimensional photographs, photographs which were nothing but promotional material developed by Pfizer, the pharmaceutical company. And it seems obvious that Sesma embellished the story a lot in his book. Ah, but wait, there's more, much more. Turns out Peña had other collaborators besides Ortuño, including two women, Mercedes and Trinidad, were part of an Eastern-like cult devised by Peña. These women helped him type and send, send some of the UMO letters because they themselves were receiving communications from a supposed Hindu ascended master, who was, of needless to say, another one of Peña's personifications. And the master convinced the women that in previous lives, they had known and abused Peña. 
So it was now part of their karmic debt to do whatever Peña asked them to, including engaging in sadomasochistic practices with him. It seems that we, these women and others were also the subject of hypnotic experimentation at the hands of Peña. Almost this, this guy was running his own DAY version of MK Ultra. And remember how we theorized that we could learn a lot about the psyche of the author behind the UMO letters by studying all the stuff about sex, sex and sadomasochistic references? Well, now you know why. I mean, this guy was a real piece of work or maybe a piece of, you know what? Okay, but the million dollar question. Why? Why go through all that trouble for so many years? And how? Remember, we're talking about hundreds of pages of technical information translated into several languages. And the letters had been sent from different countries. That's a lot of man hours and resources devoted to a prank for which Peña never received any royalties or economic benefit, at least in the form of uh, published books or, or, or movie deals or things of that nature. Um, the image in the left comes from the famous uh, and controversial Milgram shock experiment. So after his public confession, Peña told Spanish investigator Juan Jose Benitez that, that by the late 1965, he had come up with the idea of a social experiment of a grand scale to test the gullibility of flying saucer enthusiasts and the masochistic conduct of sects. You know, like I said, this guy is, is uh, uh, obsessed with masochism. Uh, and by making them believe they were contacted by ETs. So he had this idea, and with this in mind, he approached two American anthropologists with his proposal to conduct the experiment, and the two flat out refused to say, no way, this is too unethical. However, according to Peña, one of those anthropologists put him in contact with two academicians that had connections with none other than this American CIA. And these scientists told them the agency, the agency was willing to support his little brainchild of his. So again, according to Peña, the CIA financed the project and helped him with the more technical details of the UMO information. So that will explain how he managed to obtain that uh, special a piece of plastic that was only used by NASA at the time. But you might be thinking, okay, what was in it for the, for the CIA? Uh, aside from the possibility that they too might be interested in conducting a long-term psychosocial experiment using UFOs as a manipulation tool, you know, what Ballet suspected all along, and that we all know that the Langley boys are really not that concerned with, you know, ethics and morals. Uh, there's all, uh, Peña claimed that the institution, as he called it in, in, in his response to Juan Jose, Benite, Juan Jose Benitez, was capable of sending ciphered messages within the letters to infiltrated agents behind the Iron Curtain, East Germany and Romania predominantly. So again, after we scratched, scratched through the veneer of plausibility used to perpetrate the hoax, we found another veneer of plausibility used to justify the hoax. Deceptions nested under more deceptions. Excuse me while I take a sip of water. Okay. Who does he remind you of? I mean, this is kind of like a no brainer, right guys? The lies and deceptions concocted by Peña reminds us of another controversial figure in ufology, Mr. Richard Doty. <laughs> they both seeded lies and disinformation to individuals they befriended. Fernando Sesma in the case of Peña, Paul Benewitz in the case of Doty. Peña never felt any remorse in lying to his victims. He, his rationale was, hey, I kept trying to tell them, no, don't believe this, and it's not my fault if they did, okay? And in the case of Benewitz, in the case of, uh, sorry, Dotti, he did claim to feel a bit of remorse for what he did to Benewitz. 
And but he said that it was done for reasons of national security. Like I said, you should read Project Beta by Re Greg Bishop to learn more. People who interview these individuals have found many contradictions in their testimony. As Vicente Ortuño, you know, uh, Peña's collaborator, told Benitez, Peña made a sport out of lying. So which leaves us with a fundamental problem. Why believe in the lies of a liar? You know, and why believe in the words of a liar? Peña claimed he was a collaborator of the CIA, but never provided any documentation to prove that. And Dodi, to this day, denies that he was the author of the, you know, uh, polemic MJ-12 papers. So where do we draw the line with these people? Uh, remember the Belgian flap of the 1990s? That's a little photo in the center. It took only one person to claim he had been the one who had faked that famous Triangle, like you, triangle UFO photo, which was considered by some to be one of the best graphic UFO evidence without providing any sort of evidence to back up this claim, mind you, for skeptics and the media to buy it and say in case closed without any questions. So why is the public so willing to believe the claims of a self-confessed hoaxer is what I am I'm asking. True Umo case or true Umo cases. Remember how Peña claimed he had been the one who had designed the famous symbol? Well, in 2007, JJ Benitez publishes this book uh, on the left, The Man Who Whispered to the Umites, in which, among other things, gathers an impressive array of cases, independent of the Umu affair, in which the Umo symbol, or a symbol very similar to it, was reported by witnesses. Benitez even claimed he found independent witnesses for both the Aluche and the San Jose de Valderas cases, who have nothing to do with Jose Luis Jordan Peña. Obviously, the most famous among these cases is the 1989 Boronesh case in Russia, which I'm sure all of you have heard of. Some investigators took the symbol reported by the children who were witnesses of the event as evidence that the KJB could have been involved in the UMO deception. But to that, we should then ask why only this one case from the former Soviet Union? And why just when the Soviet Union was crumbling down? Surely there were more pressing things for the Kremlin to worry about, like, for example, the impending fall of the Berlin Wall, that which took place like uh, just a, a month after the, the Voronezh sighting. The Voronezh sighting happened in September 27, and the, the fall of Berlin, the, the Berlin Wall started in November 9th, 1989. So, in other words, what we're saying here is that even though the letters are fake, the symbol is still connected to genuine cases. Other things uncovered by Benitez in his book is the appearance of Umo-like symbols in documents, rock carvings, and folklore dating all the way back to early antiquity. The cover of his book, for example, was taken during one of his trips to Africa, where he showed the Umo symbol to the elders of the Dogon tribe. The elders of the tribe told Benitez the symbol was shared among the high initiates from father to son, and it was associated with the arcs carrying their gods, the famous gnomos we've all heard about. So, Make of that what you will. Could intelligence organizations have ended up involved in the UMO affair? As it was briefly mentioned earlier, in the 60s, the Spanish secret police was definitely interested in whatever was shared during Cessna's ufological salons at the Happy Whale, the same way that the FBI kept track of the American contactees for fear of possible communist propaganda. But there's another episode which I made reference uh, in my Mysterious Universe article of 2019, which seems to imply someone was willing to keep the Umo ball rolling even after Peña had quit due to the stroke, stroke he suffered in 1988. In 1996, Rafael Farriols received a couple of Umo letters which suggest that someone had hacked into his computer to read an unpublished manuscript of his. The first letter asked Farriols to verbalize any questions he would like to have answered by the Umites, 
but in the second letter, the Umites asked him to speak louder because they couldn't hear him. Uh, and by the way, the photo at the top, that's uh, Rafael Farriol's uh, home state in, in Barcelona. And I don't know if you can get to see that, but on the top of that like conical uh, uh, part of the, of the house, there is the, the, the Umo symbol as a kind of like, uh, what do you call this, the lightning, lightning thing that the thing that you uh, was used to prevent lightning bolts okay but uh, we know thanks to edward snowden's revelations that listening to conversations in closed rooms by shooting a laser that detects the vibrations of glass windows is totally possible the problem is that the windows in Ferriol's private study the, that's the thing that's on top of the ha his house the, the windows were not made of glass. They were made of soundproof plexiglass. Remember, his business was in, in, in selling acrylic plastic, which is why the Umites or whoever were passing themselves as Umites, maybe they couldn't listen to him because maybe their, their, their laser was calibrated for, for glass and not, and not uh, plastic. So again, we're left with the uncertainty. Now, the problem with the Umo affair is that both the symbol and the mythology can be hijacked by anyone. Anyone can claim to have received a letter from Umo or a visit from the Umites, just like anyone can claim to be in contact with the Ashtar command decades after George Van Tassel passed away. Here are two examples of this, and we warned we, we're going to have to discuss some very unsavory issues. I know even worse than you know eating excrements and things like that. The image in the left shows Eduardo Gonzalez Arenas, the leader of a sect called Edelweiss, which in the 1980s disguised itself as a Boy Scout group, but was in fact a front to hunt down, recruit, and sexually abuse young children. Gonzalez Arenas told his victims he was an extraterrestrial prince from the planet Nazar, and that he will, he will take them to his planet if they follow his orders. And then among some of the horrible things he did to his victim was to brand uh, some of these children with the Umo symbol in one of their hands with a hot iron. I told you it was going to be worse. Jordan Peña, the mastermind behind the Umo hoax, said that he chose to come out, come out and confess in 93 because he felt bad about he, how his symbol had been used to abuse these children. The image on the right is the cover of a book, of a book published this year titled the Utopia of the Umite, written by Italian General Antonio Papalardo, leader of the right-wing movement, ILM, or Italy Liberation Movement. According to Papalardo, one night he was taking a late stroll with his wife in the region of L'Aquila, when suddenly a seven-foot-tall man approached them. The man had a gray overcoat and a large brim hat, and made a very kind of ceremonious bow to try to calm them down. And without wasting any time, told them he was an extraterrestrial being from the planet Umo. And then he produced a manuscript from one of his pockets and gave it to Papalardo, asking him to publish it. I read fragments of this book. You can do that too uh, uh, using uh, Amazon Kindle. And it's an uber weird Dan Brown meets Doctor Who meets Alex Jones kind of historical fiction in which the bad guys are the Illuminati, of course, and the good guys are working with the Umites who want to help us and lead us into a new era and embrace the love of their god, Xema. So three main problems here. The men of Umo, like we said, were never described to be particularly tall. They never intended to come as sav saviors of humanity. Remember, these were not space brothers. They were, these were explorers. And their god was not called Xema. It was Woa. So what the hell? So these two appropriation examples help to illustrate how, unfortunately, the Umo affair has always found itself intersected, perhaps accidentally or perhaps by design, with disturbing right-wing undercurrents. But not all the ramifications or rumifications are bad. Uh, the same Juan Jose Benitez, who we've been mentioning previously, is not only a UFO investigator, but is also known in the Spanish-speaking world for his highly, highly successful series of novels known as Caballo de Troya or Trojan Horse, which have absolutely nothing to do with John Keel. 
Uh, the first book, which you can see there on, on the left, was published in 1984, and the last book was published just last year. 11 books in total in this series. And the books deal with a supposed secret U.S. government project, which, pro project which had the goal of going back in time to Palestine in the time of Jesus of Nazareth. And even through the, though the books are largely regarded as fictitious, Benitez has al always claimed that the story itself is rooted in real events, but he's always been shady about it. And when asked, he claims that one day the whole truth will be revealed, possibly after he passes away. He's 74 years old, by the way. So why bring this up when talking about Umo? The reason is that in Benitez's novels, the technology utilized by the American project to travel back in time was almost exactly like the technology described in the Umo letters. For example, the novel details how the American scientists had discovered that the subatomic particles modern physicists keep find their finding are just an illusion and that the fundamental building block in the universe was something they called swivels. And it's, it is by changing the axis of orientation of these swivels that their capsule was able to transport, transport them to the different time period. And these swivels sound exactly like the Ivozo Uo described by the Umites that their spaceships manipulated to find shortcuts in space-time. And their computers used a 12-base system and used titanium crystals to store trillions of bits of inf information. And is, this also appears in the Caballo de Troya novels. Now, as to why Benitez chose to make use of the material found in the Umo letters to write his novels is something that, to my knowledge, he's never revealed. Maybe he thought it would be easier to, to use the Umo material instead of trying to imagine a plausible method of time travel out of whole cloth. Oh, and, and I'm sure you guys recognize our waving blonde Nordic alien Orthon on the right image. The reason I include it here, here is because in Benitez's novels, the angels that appear before Jesus from time to time are described almost exactly as Adamski described his Venusian space brothers, right up to the Persian style pants and the broad belts. Oh, and he also used the location of Adamski's tomb, tomb in Arlington Cemetery in the plot of the first novel. I will suggest that people try to read these novels and they are highly entertaining and informative, but unfortunately they have never been translated into the English language. All right. So what are we to conclude of all this? How do we judge the Umu affair? A mere hoax, a PSYOP study funded by an intelligence organization, none of the above. And what about the cases that had nothing to do with the UMO affair, but in which the UMO symbol was reported nonetheless? Juan Jose Benitez, on the conclusion of his book, The Man Who Whispered to the Umites, wrote this. The manipulators of the UMO affair have themselves been manipulated. Humans have pulled the strings of humans without knowing that they too were just the marionettes of the non-humans. You see, one of Benitez's suggestions is that someone chose to use a real UFO symbol in order to create the UMO hoax. But I'm not sure if Benitez has ever read the book Mutants and Mystics by Jeffrey Kripal, in which he shows these sort of weird cross-pollinations between fiction and reality are actually not that uncommon. The picture in the center, in case you've never seen it, is a sketch made by the participants of the famous Philip experiment in 1972. The objective of this parapsychology study was to try to create a spectral entity called Philip that actually never existed in real life. And the results obtained suggest that you can get real life psychic results from a fictitious story if you inject enough energy into it. So was this what happened with the Umo affair? Was it perhaps the objective of those behind the hoax to try and manifest real UFO events from a UFO hoax and use the UMO symbol, or a sigil, if you will, as a sort of psychic hashtag to keep track of the results? Or was this a totally unexpected expected outcome? And UMO became a sort of rogue thought, thought projection that escaped out of the control of their makers. The same way Alexandra David Neal, picture on the right, is credited with having created a tulpa, which was starting to acquire a life of its own until she put an end to it. These are questions I propose, yet I cannot answer. 
In his journal, Forbidden Science, Volume 3, Jacques Vallée wrote these two quotes referring to Umo. Number one, I have long thought that hoaxes could hide deeper truths than all the candor of scientific fact. And the second one, hoaxes are very important. They can change the world. A well-fashioned fake is more convincing than messy reality. The world may well be changed by such a fabrication. I wouldn't be surprised if someone discovered some documents or even some artifacts demonstrating extraterrestrial contact with the US government. How would we know what was real? TTSA, anyone? As for myself, I will continue to be on the lookout for new and unexpected manifestations of the UMO symbol to remind myself of the liminality of the UFO phenomenon, which may very well originate from a different reality that can only be intersected occasionally through the mysterious workings of human consciousness. To remind me that you can never stamp you a UFO story as a case closed because new information can always be obtained to either reinforce or refute it. To remind me that hoaxes do have a frustrating role to play in the unfolding of these confounding mysteries. Hoaxes are in fact an important but misunderstood component in the scaffolding of high strangeness phenomena. And finally, to remind me that where there is smoke, there is always the possibility of fire. Thank you for listening to my presentation. Have a good day and have fun. Oh, thank you so much, Miguel. Uh, this is such a fascinating case. And um, oh, let me, yeah, yes, have, have fun. Uh, folks can uh, support Miguel by going to his website, absurdbydesign.com and supporting him through his commissioned artwork. Uh, he is a joy to work with and obviously a great talent. And it's because of his intellect and his uh, uh, wide Fortean anomalistic uh, integrity that uh, has led him to be such a, a fascinating writer in the uh, UFO and paranormal scene. And you can read his work at Daily Grail. Uh, is that, that's the dailygrail.com? Yes. Right. Yeah. All right. Well, um, uh, Miguel, we're just about out of time here. I'm going to get ready for our next guest. Sorry, I don't have any time for any uh, uh, comments or questions. But of course, uh, the, the the commentary is, of course, stellar. They, they love your pr presentation. And the information is, of course, fascinating. Thank you. Um, well, thanks again, Miguel. We'll talk soon. Take care. Gracias. Oh, sorry. Yes. <laughs> All right, folks. Um, we'll be back in just a minute. Uh, uh, I am Smiles Lewis and uh, with the Anomaly Archives. Uh, real quick, we are still at the, uh, where are we at? We are at the uh, 1331 uh, range for our fundraising here. We are trying to reach, uh, it would be great if we could reach 2000 or, or 3000 and higher, of course, our goal being uh, $20,000. But uh, I'm going to be back in momentarily with our next presenter. And that is uh, Professor Wham. And I'm really excited about this presentation. So we will be back in just a few minutes. Sit tight and get ready for a very interesting lecture. Thank you. <laughs>